Thank you all for coming out uh, this afternoon, although I can see by you know, the location it's not such a difficult place uh, to come along. So hopefully my talk will uh, not de deter you from uh, future, future visits. First, I'd like to thank the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Art for uh, inviting me to be a scholar in residence and to work with the collection for the next week. Uh, and it's great to begin with, with, with a lecture. Uh, I'd also like to thank Deborah uh, and Carol Cuhawk uh, for all that they have done to arrange for my visit and to make it such a smooth entry today. Uh, one further word, I, I made this uh, uh, what, warning at the beginning uh, of my lectures uh, for the East West Center. I, I don't read or speak Chinese. Uh, so for those of you among the audience who do I have made every effort not to uh, hurt your ears too much in my pronunciations. And oftentimes, the words that I'm pronouncing are also on the screen in pinyin. So that might help uh, to uh, you know, make it a little bit easier <clears throat> if my Scottish Chinese isn't uh, up to snuff. So uh, the title, A Timurid Embassy from Herat to Beijing, 1419-22, recorded by artist Gyathadin Nakash, uh, Timurid Art After China. Uh, a long title, I'm sorry about that. But to begin with a story. Uh, when Alexander of Macedon traveled to China to meet with the emperor, in the course of their meeting, the discussion turned to painting, and an argument ensued about which painting tradition was better, the Greek or the Chinese. A competition was initiated the Chinese emperor ordered that a vaulted chamber be constructed and divided by a curtain. Greek and Chinese artists started to work at each side of the curtain without knowledge of the other's activity. And at the moment of completion, Alexander was brought to the chamber and the curtain pulled back across the center of the room and Alexander was perplexed, the gesture shown here by him putting his finger to his lip, signaling his astonishment. Here, the artist uh, depicts the puzzle that Alexander saw. When the curtain was removed, he saw identical paintings at either end of the room. How could Alexander account for the Greek and Chinese artists' apparent imitation of each other? Drawing from the lessons of his teacher, Aristotle, Alexander used empirical method to get at the heart of the optical phenomenon. When the curtain was redrawn across the room, Alexander looked behind the cloth to the Greek wall, where he saw the painting just as he had seen it before. When he turned around and peered beyond the curtain toward the Chinese wall, now he only saw the curtain's reflection. Alexander determined that while the Greek artist had painted his wall, the Chinese artist had polished his wall to make a mirror surface. <laughs> to present the paradox to the viewer, the artist has bookended the two ends of the room so that both paintings can be seen at once by you, the viewer. This is a story that's common in Persian literature though the authors present and interpret the story in different ways. In the poet Nizami's version, Alexander judges the Greeks best at painting and the Chinese best at polishing, <laughs> and leaves it at that. In Jalaluddin Rumi's version, the story carols a moral imperative in addition to its constant didactic value. So Alexander is an exemplary ruler who shows good judgment. He's able to enact all of the lessons that he's learned from his teachers. For Rumi, the Greek artist embodies cognitive exoteric knowledge and is equated with the Sunni Muslim orthodoxy. So this is religion that's learned by reading books and listening to teachers. Whereas the Chinese artist embodies sensual esoteric knowledge and is equated with the Sufi mystic, with Sufi mysticism. Rather than dwell on what was manifest in creation or what one can learn by books or cognitively, the Sufi mystic looks inward and forgets or annihilates the self 
erasing the ego in a process that's likened to polishing the heart. And it's after these acts of piety, of polishing the heart, that the heart becomes a blank slate that's capable of reflecting the divine. So in Rumi's version, the Chinese artist embodies uh, this effort. They don't actively make a painting. They simply create a, a mirror surface that will show what is already visible in the world. There are lots of other metaphors about Chinese artists that crop up in Persian literature. Uh, one of the most common is to the magic making, Jadu Taban, artists of China. Sorcerers, Jadu Tirazan, of art who make strange and wonderful images. Is the sound too loud at this point, or you're OK? No? To, to me, it seems too loud. OK. Uh, these are frequently used metaphors of Chinese picture magic uh, that can either be taken in favorable terms as praise of manual dexterity and the astonishing images created through virtuoso artistic performance, or in negative terms as images that were suspect in their nature presumably because they were so appealing and seductive to the eye. The latter meaning could be highlighted in texts that mention Chinese artists by invoking the noun khata, which in Persian means a blunder or an inadvertent trespass, through a word play with the Persian adjective for Chinese, khatai. Hence, Chinese art might be sinful, but it was a forgivable sin. Now, I begin with these metaphors from Persian literature because they involve comparisons between art traditions from Iran and China. And they simply couldn't have taken place without knowledge of Chinese artistic production. This lecture focuses on a specific encounter that took place between Timurid and Ming dynasties in the early 15th century, and how it, as well as other exchanges, resulted in the adoption and adaptation of a range of Chinese artistic sources into Islamic art. One might say that in these encounters, the Persian artist mirrored Chinese sources, but always with the goal of transforming and improving what was seen, never a slavish imitation. Presenting aspects of these visual encounters will involve a close look at the dynamics of artistic production and the broad artistic implications of assimilating Chinese art into the Timurid courtly arts. And my lecture is divided into three parts. The first part is a short overview of the historical context, the ground against which these events took place. Second, the Timurid embassy to Beijing from Herat that took place between 1419 and 1422 recorded by an artist, Giyathadin Nakash. It's the only text that we have written by an artist that records such an embassy. It's an extraordinary document. And third, the responses in Timurid art to Chinese portable objects and works on paper. So what did artists in Iran do with all of these things that came from China? So relations between Timur, founder of the Timurid dynasty, and central, uh, and that ruled over Iran and Central Asia, and his contemporary, Yong Le, third emperor of the Ming dynasty, were pretty frosty. Timur's relations with China had seen better days. During the reign of Hong Wu, embassies were dispatched regularly to the West, and Timur reciprocated up until 1394, when an exchange of letters prompted his displeasure. Hong Wu misread a letter asserting Timur's submission to him and noted this in the return correspondence sent to Timur. Timur's response was to detain and execute the messenger sent by Hong Wu and his successor Yong Le, and later to promise that he would deliver tribute in person to the Ming court in Nanjing. Timur died in 1405 at Otrar in southern Kazakhstan on his last military campaign to China, leading an army of some 200,000 men. It was interesting to think of what would have happened had he not died. 
Timur hoped that his victory over the Chinese, he predicted that he would emerge victorious, uh, the, the victory over the Chinese infidels, as he described them, would wipe out the bad deeds of his past. After Timur's death, Yongle made every effort to secure his vast western frontier by fostering a trade tribute system with inner Asian potentates in such cities as Kashgar, Khotan, Turfan, and Hami, which he intended to make a buffer zone between the Ming and Timurid empires. The inner Asians were eager to trade jade, sal ammoniac, raisins, camels, sheep, and horses for Chinese silks, garments, tea, and porcelain. And I might add that it's a great pleasure to give this talk in front of Professor Rasabi, whose work has been so important in detailing the implications of these exchanges that took place between East and West Asia. So there were some 44 tribute missions from Hami that arrived at Yongle's court during his reign, with one from Hami in 1422 delivering the emperor 1,300 horses. Yongle was equally successful in attracting missions from Timurid lands, some 20 delegations in all, principally from Samarkand and Herat. By 1409, Yong Le had already sent a secretary, Fu An, with the goal of renewing China's relations with the Timurids and their ruler, Shah Rukh, who succeeded his father, Timur, in 1409. From 1409, Shah Rukh and Yong Le exchanged embassies roughly every two to three years. It was a period of regular exchange that ended under Xuan De, Yong Le's successor. One of the Chinese embassies was described by Qin Cheng, who died in 1426, an emissary of Yong Le, who arrived in Herat in October 1410 and stayed for at least two months before starting the return journey to Nanjing, which became capital between 1368 and lasted until 1421. He left a somewhat laconic diary listing places and distances difficult, the Shi Yu Xing Chung Ji, and a more detailed travel guide of Central Asian towns titled Shi Yu Fan Gua Chi. In several aspects, Chen Cheng's texts are similar to the narrative recorded by Timurid artist Gyathadin Nakash, who traveled to Beijing in 1419. Before I turn to Gyathadin's narrative, it's worth noting that other Persian sources, particularly official histories, record the traffic between Ming and Timurid territories. The most detailed accounts are of embassies in 1412, 1417, and 1419. In his account of the year 1417, for example, historian Abdul Razak Samarkandi records that the Chinese emissaries were accompanied by 300 horsemen and brought Shah Rukh many gifts and money, falcons, satins, silks of one color, uh, including silks of gold brocade, red silks, Chinese ceramics, Chinese paper, although, um, uh, well, you can see the examples of Chinese paper that were used for the production of uh, Islamic manuscripts and, and these examples, these start to emerge from the 1420s and continue up until the 1450s. As well as provisions, I think the Persian is alati chini, uh, so it's not specified what these provisions or objects are. As well as special gifts for the princes and the great lords, uh, official correspondence and a painting. When the 1412 embassy returned to Beijing, which is references Khan Balig in Persian, sources, an Amir Syed Ahmed Turkhan, a Timurid noble, had sent Yong Le a white horse. Yong Le was so pleased with the horse that he ordered a painting to be made of it and sent with the next embassy in 1417. The painting depicting the horse with two equerries um, 
was the, was the result. Uh, this is a painting on silk mounted to the pages of an album assembled in Tabriz in northwest Iran in 1544 to 45. And uh, there are actually two other copies of this pairing of paintings that are not specifically datable to any period. Um, so we can't determine if any of these extant paintings is actually the painting referenced by Samarkandi, commissioned by Yongle, and sent to the Timurid court. But I think that the fact that this was such a special event recorded in the Persian histories and repeated in subsequent versions of those Persian histories written by different historians may have provided a sufficient stimulus for artists to either discover, rediscover these historical paintings or to make new versions uh, of them. I like to think that these are actually based on the original paintings that were sent, if not the original painting itself. Another written source from this period of peaked exchange between Shah Rukh and Yongle was recorded in the form of a journal, a ruzname, literally a day book, by the artist Giathadin Nakash, who traveled from Balkh to Khan Balig, Beijing, leaving in December 1419 and returning almost three years later in August 1422. Unlike at Chin Ching, little can be ascertained about Giathadin outside of his narrative report. We know virtually nothing about his life, his biography. The closest link that we can establish to physical evidence of his artwork is offered by a progress report, a document called the Arza Dasht, which describes the various art objects being made in the royal workshop in Herat about 1430, so some 10 years after the embassy. So if, it's, if this is the same Giathadin Nakash referenced in this document from about 1430 as the one who wrote the journal of the embassy to China, we know that at that point in time, he was still working on illustrations to manuscripts, including a copy of the poet uh, Saadi's Gulistan or Rose Garden, uh, which was a didactic and very humorous text commissioned by one of Timur's grandsons named Bai Songur. Uh, and he was the person who had sent Giathadin, th the artist, to represent him on the embassy some 11 years before. So perhaps this is one and the same man. Giathadin isn't uh, such an unusual name, uh, but it's also not such a common name. So fortunately, it's not Muhammad. If it was Muhammad, it would be virtually useless as any kind of a diagnostic. Um, so just to give a little summary of the embassy, I have two pages in PowerPoint like this, and then we'll move away from these sorts of text-heavy presentations. But we know that um, versions of Giathadin's journal were included among several official histories, and I summarize them in the list at the bottom of this page, uh, including one by Hafiz Abru, uh, the Baisunguri Cream of Chronicles from 1427, this is the closest record of his narrative uh, to the date of the embassy. It's largely uh, repeated by Abdul Razak Samarkandi and his rising of the two stars and meeting of the two seas before 1482. And again, in the historian Mirchon's Rosata Safa, the Garden of Purity before 1498. And then largely copied again by Khondamir, who is um, Mirchon's grandson uh, by about 1524. And if you compare all of the different versions of these Persian texts to the one in, say, the Hafiz Abru, which is the earliest dated one, there are slight differences between them in vocabulary, verbal structure, grammar, choice of adjectives. But each one attributes the text to the authorship of Giathadin. In the preamble to the journal presented by Mirchand, which is the version I'll focus on, uh, we learn that Shah Rukh ordered the embassy and asked a person named uh, Shadi Khaja to lead it. 
and that Shadi Khaja and Giyathadin had decided from the day of departure to that of return, quote, to record on the pages of their notebooks without addition or deletion all they witnessed events, condition of roads, construction of towns, description of garrisons, situations of buildings, conditions of kings, etc. And that when they returned, Giathedin was responsible for writing down everything that they had seen in the form of a journal. So, Betariki Ruzname. So the idea is that they would record notes on the journey and that this would be written up into a developed narrative upon the return, but that that narrative would retain the chronological features, the linear narrative features that had been set down in the notebook. Shadi Khaja performed the duties of heading the embassy and representing Shah Rukh, but shared the latter capacity with another man named Kokcha. The narrative identifies representatives chosen by Shah Rukh, as well as his sons by Sungur and Soyur Gatmish, uh, who selected Sultan Ahmed and Giyathadin Nakash, uh, and a person named Arghudak, respectively. It seems that Shah Rukh had intended another son named Ibrahim Sultan uh, to have representation, as well as Rustam Mirza, a, cousin, a, a, a nephew. Um, but the, em but the uh, emissaries that Ibrahim Sultan and Rustam Mirza had sent actually met the embassy on its return leg at a place named Sukju. And then in addition, um, there was uh, an embassy sent by another son of um, Shah Rukh named Ulug Beg. And those um, emissaries traveled on ahead of the, of the embassy sent by Shah Rukh. So altogether, um, these various people who were given the opportunity to send representatives and the representatives themselves um, outline a sort of a political framework for the embassy uh, where under the aegis of Shah Rukh's supreme rule, members of his direct and extended family, as well as an emir and hereditary kings of one territory controlled by the Timurids, uh, namely Badak Shan, sent envoys. So together, the provinces of uh, Khurasan, Mazandaran, Khwarazm, Badakhshan, and Ghazni Kabul, Kandahar, were represented with other regions, Transoxiana or Central Asia and Fars, southern Iran, also given representation, but by groups that had separated it off from the main group, either because they had gone out later or had gone out uh, earlier. So as a totality, this was an embassy uh, very much conceptualized as a representation of the entire Timurid realm at that point in time. Another frighteningly long list of names, <laughs> but we won't stick in it for, for, for much longer. So Gyathadin, in writing this narrative, represents this movement through time and space by naming toponyms. These are either settlements like Samarkand or topographical features like Karamuran, which was the Yellow River, or regions like the Yulduz Prairie. And he marks those either these toponyms um, by the time. He gives them a temporal marker by mentioning the day or time of the month and year. Uh, hence, on the 18th of Jumada 1, which is May 31st, the emissaries reach the place called Satlubu. So this is how the narrative is, is constructed. This serves as a framework for descriptions and commentaries of what he sees and experiences but also enables a reconstruction of the route for the outward journey and the return journey. Uh, and I prepared this synopsis of places and dates for both legs of the journey, um, just in case you would like to look at it more closely um, during the Q and A. So it, it's there. We don't have to worry about it too much just now. But one thing that you'll notice is the level of detail supplied for the outward journey is far more comprehensive than the return, which is it's, this is quite common in travel narratives. It's really 
It's always more interesting to get to your destination than it is to go back home. So the embassy left Herat and journeyed um, to Balkh and then to Samarkand and then to Tashkent and then to Sairam. Uh, these are the main places that are visible on the map that I have on the screen. Um, when they got to Samarkand, they waited there for a while to be joined by the emissaries representing Soyur Gatmish, Amir Shah Malik, and the Shahs of Badakhshan, who were coming separately, all converging on Samarkand. And they're also waiting for the Chinese en envoys who had been there from the previous embassy. So this was a gathering place for the larger group to travel on. Uh, when they had all gathered in Samarkand, they moved to Tashkent, then to Sairam, and then to a place called Ashpara, which is not on the map, but I suspect somewhere about here, um, on the border of Timurid-controlled Transoxania. And then they traveled to a place named Salubu, which took them squarely into a territory controlled by the Khans of Mughulistan. And then from Salubu, they continued east, uh, crossing the river Kungez. think so. Nobody said that they could, so maybe you couldn't. Okay. Um, they crossed the river Kungaz and entered the Yulduz prairie that was used by the Mughals as a summer pasture. And Gyathadin comments that although they reached this place in midsummer, uh, that the, quote, water was frozen to a depth of two fingers. So not much of a summer pasture. Anyway, as they continued east, they forded rivers and traversed the mountains, quote, as rain and sleet fell from the clouds. The embassy emerged from the mountains, the northern part of the Tian Shan, in a town named Turfan. And this, as a route, seems to have tracked south, but roughly parallel to the more frequently used Silk Road, which would have led them across the uh, river uh, Illy. from a more northerly uh, route. So following the edge of the Tian Shan Mountains to Urumqi and Turfan. From Turfan, the embassy traveled to a place named Karahaje or Kocho, where Chinese emissaries met them and recorded their names and numbers. So the Timurids were inventoried by the Chinese in Kocho. They went to a place named Atasufi, and arrived in Kamul, or Hami, here, so in uh, Xinjiang today. There are several unnamed stages that include the location of a banquet hosted by a man named Wang Daji, where the Timurid embassy was again counted. At this point, they numbered 510 persons, and um, mentioned before the embassy arrived in a place named Karawul. So simultaneously, we're trying to translate the terms that Gyathadin gives to places and the terms that they're known um, in historical Chinese sources as well as in modern Chinese sources. So Karawul seems to have been Jiayuguan here. From there, they traveled southeast to Sukju, which is what he calls Zhou Chen, and then on to a place he calls Kanju, uh, which is uh, Zhang Ye. The direction of this movement tracks south of the Great Wall through the Hushi <coughs> corridor of Gansu province, a passage connecting inner and east Asian regions of China. Uh, Gyathadin next mentions crossing the Karamuran River or the Yellow River. Wherever the embassy crossed the river, a large settlement lay on its eastern bank. From that point, the path of the itinerary is much less clear. 
Giathedin mentions passing through towns and traversing rivers, each of which was twice the breadth of the Oxus. He's constantly trying to find terms of comparison to what is familiar back home, and crossing several more rivers. The next place he identifies is Jadin Fu, which is a Persian transcription of some kind of a Chinese name. Uh, it's generally identified today as uh, Qingding in, this is the hardest province to pronounce, Hebei. All right? Okay. Thanks, Morris. <laughs> um, I'm really trying up here, I have to say. Eleven days later, uh, the Timurid embassy reached Beijing. So uh, at this point, the embassy followed a northerly tracked route, but one that's more distant from the line of the Great Wall, that took them from Gansu province across the modern provinces of Ningxia, Shanxi, Shanxi, and Hebei. They crossed the Yellow River somewhere between the modern towns of Yinchuan to the north and Lanzhou to the south. So, Yinchuan and Lanzhou. So, somewhere between here was the place through which the embassy passed, traveled. The return journey from Beijing beginning in mid-May 1421, by contrast, took a much deeper southerly passage from modern Linfen in Shanxi province, across the Yellow River, and northwest to Kamju, Sukju, and Kamul, Hami. And from there, they traveled along the south of the Taklamakan desert to Khotan, Kashgar, then into modern Uzbekistan, Andijan, and then on to Balkh reaching Herat on the 28th of August in 1422. And it mentioned before that the description of the return journey comprises only very brief references to the route, the dates, and the people met. Uh, going home is clearly of much less interest. These maps are not so clear. But the last major stopping place in uh, Hebei was probably uh, here before they reached Beijing. So the first reference to architecture, not this yet, but um, it's more interesting than the map. Uh, the first reference to architecture is brief and concerns the huge idol temples, Bot Khani Hai Bozorg of Torfan, a city where most of the people were idolaters, Aksarimardom Bot Parast Budand. The room of one temple housing a great idol, which people said was a representation of Shakyamuni, so Gautama uh, Shakyamuni, the Buddha. At an intersection on the network of roads forming the Silk Road, Turfan had been ruled periodically by the Chinese since the first century BCE and Islamized from the late 1300s. The next settlement to merit comment is Hami where Giathadin notes the polyconfessionalism of the community as evidenced by its architecture. Here, the great mosque, built by the city's ruler, Amir Fakhreddin, stood opposite a Buddhist temple. The temple housed several idols, one of them the size of a 10-year-old boy. Large and small paintings of fantastic forms made by the idolaters lined the temple and representations of demons in combat flanked the door. The third settlement to inspire description is Jiayu Guan, a very strong fortress surrounded by mountains. The fortress had two gates, one leading in, one out. And this has been identified as the pass at the westernmost end, sorry, of the Great Wall as a key point in the network of routes making up the Silk Road, it was located at the narrowest point in the Hushi corridor between the Chilean mountains and uh, others to the, to the north. As such, it played a key strategic function in China's defenses under the Ming. Uh, they built a fortress here in 1372, uh, as it had under earlier dynasties. Modern Zhou Chuan, the next stop, is given a richer description as an urban form 
and in aspects of daily life. I don't have pictures of it, unfortunately. The fact that domestic pigs were kept in people's homes and that mutton and pork hung alongside each other in the markets indicates a definitive move to a predominantly non-Muslim world. Sukju, uh, Zhou Chen, was encircled by strong and high walls, square in shape, and had numerous bazaars, each 50 cubits wide. Covered towers were built at regular intervals atop the city walls, and four city gates were arranged opposite each other in cardinal orientation. The two-storied pavilions marking the gates were decorated with colored tiles, as were the walls, a custom Giathedin likens to architecture in Mazandaran on the Caspian Sea. A large, highly ornamented and decorated archway with crenellations when Chinese stalactites, he calls them Mukarnasi Khatai, was erected in each bazaar. In each, uh, sorry, in addition to many bazaars, Sukju featured numerous temples, each one very large in size and paved with cut baked brick. Giathedin remarks on the cleanliness of the temples and that good-looking boys stood in their doorways calling out for people to enter. Giathedin is at his most overtly ethnographic in describing Zhou Chen. He describes aspects of city life in inferential comparative terms, both the consumption of pork and the non-halal practice of hanging mutton alongside pork, which risked cross-contamination of even ritually slaughtered animals, and in direct terms by likening an architectural practice that could be found in Mazandaran in Iran with um, a term, a, the Chinese stalactites, uh, that made the comparison comprehensible to his readers, uh, referencing the features of wooden construction. So he uses a language and a form taken from his home culture to try and explain what it is the Chinese architecture looks like. Uh, and he's speaking here about Chinese wood bracketing systems used in the temples uh, that resembled the Temerid Mokarnas. The next settlement to merit description is Kamju or Changye. Giathedin jumps into a description of a temple 500 cubits square that housed a reclining idol at its center, quote, 50 cubits tall, 9 cubits wide at the feet, and 21 cubits the circumference of the head. Other idols stood behind it and elsewhere, and paintings and designs in the temple included representations of bakshis that moved in such a way that the viewer imagined they were alive. The reclining gilded and clothed idol had one arm under its head and the other over its face. Giathedin remarks that there were other buildings around the temple resembling cells in a caravanserai, outfitted with gold-spun curtains, gilded platforms, chairs, candlesticks, and banqueting vessels. Elements of Giathedin's account enable us to identify the temple as the giant Buddhist temple dating from the Western Shia dynasty and containing a sculptural image of the reclining Nirvana Buddha of approximately the same dimensions as those enumerated by Giatha Din. Uh, the ten disciples um, standing behind uh, the Nirvana Buddha um, and there were also 18 saintly guardians or Lohans placed in the side halls and here's an image uh, of the, the Lohans. He also describes wall paintings, um, but without identifying their subject matter from the, pal from the temple today. We know that these were scenes from the mountain Sea Sutra and the journey to the west completed in the Ming period. Another building in Kamju is singled out for expanded description. It's styled by the Muslims as the celestial sphere and comprised a, quote, octagonal pavilion 15 stories from top to bottom, and in every story were belvedere's consisting of Chinese stalactites, chambers, and porticos. Paintings adorned the spaces around the belvedere's, quote, among which was the picture of a throne in which was seated an emperor with servants, slave boys and slave girls, standing to his left and right. 
The base of the pavilion bore representations that seemed to shoulder the weight of the pavilion. The pavilion measured 20 cubits in circumference and 12 in height, and was made of carved wood gilded to resemble red gold. Visiting the cellar, or the basement, Gyathedin says that he found a stone pillar standing on an iron base, and that the pillar went up to the roof of the pavilion. He adds, with the slightest motion of the pillar, the huge pavilion would shake. A comment is still completely mysterious. The pagoda can be identified with the timber pagoda, or the muta pagoda, near the Wan Cho temple, built originally in the mid to late 6th century under the northern Zhou dynasty, but repaired under later dynasties and reconstructed in 1926. Um, it's still octagonal in plan and features many of the elements that are outlined by Gyathedin um, in his description. The next city to inspire an expanded account is this Jadin Fu uh, Qingding. It was an immense city populated with many people and had a large temple and idol made of bronze and gilded, 50 cubits in height and with many arms. And he says, hence they call it the Thousand Armed. Gyathedin notes that the idol was known throughout China and follows with a very specific description of the features of the temple and its idol, both of which rested on a curiously carved stone platform with arches, and around the idol there were several stories, each with belvedere's. The heights of the eight individual stories corresponded to various positions of the idol's heel, knee, above the knee, slightly below the waist and breast, and so on to the top of the building, that had stalactites. So this is an exterior view of the building with the idol inside and the separate floors uh, leading up and around it. He said that the whole building was decorated in a manner that completely astonished the viewer. Gyathedin was able to see the idol from various vantage points and heights and noted that one could access the exterior spaces of each story. The envoys were told that the idol was cast in a standing position and required 100,000 ass loads of bronze. There were other asses better than mule, but I think more accurate. There were other smaller idols made of plaster and painted, and paintings of mountains, slopes, and caves drawn, and next to each of them are temples with pictures of monks and yogis seated in retreat performing exercises. He ends the discussion of the paintings by writing, with brushes of magic they have painted rams, tigers, leopards, dragons, and trees. And on the walls of the temples are paintings done with consummate expertise and mastery. His description concludes with the mention of other buildings at the complex and of a pagoda or celestial sphere even larger than calm Jews. The complex that Gyathedin visited is the Longshuan Monastery built under the Sui dynasty from 592 onward and rebuilt in 971 under Song dynasty emperor Tai Thu, who rules from 960 to 75. Uh, the main hall of the monastery complex, Da Be Pavilion, houses the bronze statue of the Bodhisattva Guan Yin, some 20 meters tall, cast during the Song period and standing on an altar above the ground, and it's certainly his description is entirely true of the journey that the visitor can make upwards and around the idol from inside uh, the architecture. In less than two weeks, the emissaries arrived at the gates of Khan Balik, and they found there uh, an enormous city of inordin inordinate magnitude made all of, s all of stone, uh, that because it was still under construction, had 100,000 scaffolds fastened to its city walls. And this is, of course, Da Du. Um, but not the UN palace, the new palace that was being constructed under the Ming. The emissaries were led in through a tower, also under construction, and taken to the gate of the emperor's sublime palace. 
uh, from the first gate, they walked a distance of 700 feet over a surface of cut stone, the courtyard flanked by 10 elephants standing in two files, and reached another gate where 100,000 people were standing. From that place, they saw a vast, pleasant, and captivating open area, the emperor's pavilion, with the platform set before it. Columns and three gateways were set above the platform, the central entrance reserved from the emperor's use. This was the setting for a much larger gathering of people that assembled before dawn. Giathadin adds that all along the perimeter of the courtyard were chambers, balconies, and columns of great magnitude, and that the walls of the buildings were all of jet, and the pavement was entirely of cut stone. At sunrise, the emissaries were allowed to pass through the gateway with the thousands of Chinese who had waited and entered another space, also vast and even more pleasing to the onlooker from afar than the first had been. At this point, they could see a pavilion larger than the first and a triangular-shaped dais covered with a gold-flecked yellow china silk with the designs of the phoenix and other birds, a golden chair placed on the dais, and after the ceremonies were concluded, um, Giathadin talks about how the embassy was taken um, from that space into their accommodation uh, in the post house. It's actually very difficult to map his description of the entrance to the imperial city and its several courtyards and palaces against what is extant today. I would like to be able to do that, but it's not so easy. The next day, the emissaries visited other places and attended a meeting in the city, passing through three courtyards of the imperial city, and now saw the emperor's third palace. This was a courtyard also paved with stone and endowed with a large hall. And here we have even more descriptions of um, Ming Dynasty imperial court ceremony um, that he offers us. The remaining references to architecture in the imperial city are linked to festivals in the Muslim and Chinese calendars. So in the Feast of the Sacrifice, celebrated on Ten Dhul Hijjah, the Timurid emissaries with a group of Muslims resident in the imperial city prayed in a mosque that had been built earlier uh, by Yong Le. And on the uh, 27th of January, 1421, the emissaries received a message sent by uh, Mulana Yusuf Qazi that the next day was the Chinese New Year. Um, the evening before, the emissaries were taken to a new encampment uh, that comprised an audience hall and other structures made of stone and brick. And he comments that over such a large area, some 2,000 feet in length, that the bricks were laid with such a degree of precision that there was not a hair's breadth of crookedness. So he's fascinated about the competence and the technical mastery that the Chinese uh, artists and builders evidence through their work. And in fact, he comments, the masters of stone cutting, carpentry, painting, and tile making of that region have no equals. For the week-long festival of lanterns, the Rasmi Shab Chirog, a wooden structure was erected outside the emperor's palace, covered with branches of cypress so that it looks like a mountain of emerald. Um, this is a, an earlier UN dynasty painting of the lantern festival. And that thousands of lanterns interconnected by rockets of naphtha had been arranged. He says that when one lantern was lit, the rocket carried the flame along a string to the next lantern in a sequence that culminated in the illumination of the whole. Now, someone must have told Giathadin about this practice because this year the custom was suspended um, after Chinese astrologers project, predicted damage by fire to the emperor's palace. So, in addition to the things that he saw, there were also things that he was told about by translators. Um, but he doesn't actually mention directly that there were translators who informed him about these other um, events. So I'm going to cut a little bit here in the interest um, of time. But 
the final section of the the final section of the narrative as it pertains to events in Beijing have to do with more meetings that were staged between the Timurid envoys and um, Yongle. It has to do also with the fact that a horse that was given to Yongle as a special present uh, backfired a little bit because it threw him from the horse when he tried to ride it. And after some sort of, you know, groveling, the Timurids were able to keep their lives and not <laughs> suffer the consequences. Uh, they, they told him that it was a special horse because it had been a horse used by Timur, which must have made it really quite an old horse at that point <laughs> in, in, in time. But it, it culminates with them receiving these special gifts from Yongle that are issued to the members of the embassy to be taken back to the persons who had um, sent them. So <clears throat> I'd promised art after China. Uh, here goes. Um, the clearest evidence of increased acquisition of Chinese objects in various original media is provided by this very large cache of drawings, preparatory and finished, made in the Timurid workshop in Herat, um, sponsored by royal patronage. The workshop artists produced design on paper for textiles, architectural decoration, portable objects, and also executed some of these objects, particularly illustrated luxury books. So you can see one page of mounted drawings um, on the left showing studies of animal, uh, actually on the right, studies of animal and plant subjects, uh, a circular composition uh, depicting a lion beset by three lions, uh, a cusped, I'm, no, I've got to get my left right here, I'm sorry. This, we're on the left, um, as well as a cusped medallion that contains a drawing of a lion and a dragon set over leafy plants, a study sheet composed of four alternate positions for a lion and an ox and two chi lin, and then the confronted heads of a phoenix and a dragon, as well as smaller paper sheets squeezed along the edge of the outer margin. Yet another page on the right, comprising five drawings, includes a flowering uh, branch, uh, branch bearing spiky uh, leaves and fruit, a single tree, uh, a dragon climbing a uh, flowering bush, and a study sheet that depicts a lion, various insects, and two flying birds. Uh, through these drawings, Timurid artists developed a repertoire of subjects used in different media, wood, metal, leather, stone, or paint, uh, by repeated rehearsals and adaptations from native and foreign objects. They were culling these motifs from objects of the Persian art tradition, but also from China. And they would transfer these designs from one surface to another by this transfer technique called pouncing which is why you see traces of uh, red chalk and also uh, a black chalk, um, as well as pricked outlines around the co contours of these designs um, in this process of, of transfer. It's easy enough to identify some of the possible visual sources to which Timurid artists turned. One might draw a comparison between this blue and white porcelain flask um, on the left from the Yongle period and the drawing of a branch bearing spiky leaves and fruit. Uh, Chinese porcelains were some of the most coveted objects acquired through embassies and their provenance is attested in Iran through entities like the Ardabil Shrine Collection um, in the city of Ardabil on the, on the Caspian. So there are two of these pilgrim flasks, or uh, I'm not even going to try it, uh, moon or pilgrim flasks as examples that show how a drawing like this would have been made after a porcelain object. And then this design could be applied to a number of other media. Equally plausible as uh, object resources, though unattested in Iran through histories of provenance, are things like black or red lacquer dishes uh, made in the um, yeah, 
sorry, okay. So one might introduce also, um, before we get to the carved lacquers, um, Chinese octagonal or rectangular black lacquer trays inlaid with mother of pearl, here depicting flowering plum and birds and flowering plum with sparrows and bamboo that date from the Yuan through the early Ming dynasties. And there are examples on view in the Honolulu uh, Museum. Both examples offer possible sources for bird and flower subjects developed by timorid artists uh, with the, tech of, the technique of inlay, especially available to a line-based mode of replication because of the internal graphic features exploited in the processes of um, shaping and composing pieces of mollusk shell. If you go to the Conalulu Museum, there's a beautiful low table, it's later in date, but if you look at the ways in which the pieces of mollusk shell have been laid into the lacquer, uh, you'll see how uh, the different contours of the shapes of the mollusk and the way that they are lined up against each other with the black outlines of the lacquer between them, how further lines have been added through engraving the surface of the mollusk and filling it with the black uh, medium. So it looks almost like a combination of drawing with the actual inlay of the mollusk over the lacquer. Now, Chinese mother of pearl lacquered objects are not attested in the written sources that record gifts through diplomatic embassies. And there's no single extant example of a Chinese um, lacquer that has a provenance in Iran. But I think that there can be no doubt that these were among the kinds of objects traded between the Ming and the Timurids that then became models for artists to respond to in the workshop in Herat um, through to about 14. Uh, 30. For example, this document from 1430 that I had mentioned earlier, the Progress Report, talks about a saddle that was being fashioned with inlaid mother of pearl using a design that had been made by an artist from the uh, late 14th century. So equally plausible is the um, possible object resources, again, unattested through histories of provenance in Iran, uh, were carved black or red lacquer dishes made in the early Ming dynasty period. Uh, one example on the left comprises a relief of flying peacock and peahen set against a dense array of tree peonies, with the timorid drawing on the right retaining the parent object circular composition and its subject of birds and flowers. It's a fairly faithful drawing done after a carved lacquer. I would, some of my colleagues would completely oppose me in this, but I think that the visual evidence is quite strong. So the carving on another uh, example, this covered circular box dated in the Yongle period by inscription, Da Ming Yongle Nian Zhe, comprises a fecund mass of flowers and leaves and tree peonies, uh, visual parallels to it, studies based entirely on flora without animals, can also be found among the studies created in the Timurid workshop album, including a writhing thicket uh, of lotus leaves, you see them here, um, that cannot resist twisting and curling and interpenetrating each other, both leaves and branches, with other designs for roundels on the same page framing it around the gutter edge and, and the lower edge, showing various degrees of affinity to Chinese art sources, with the one that's the most um, exciting to me actually done in a red and pink wash, uh, with the color of the pigment looking very much like a carved red lacquer, where this drawing in red and pink wash was not a common drawing medium in Timurid. Uh, Iran, certainly for a finished drawing. Um, I'll show you these uh, details of a binding and a carved sandalwood uh, box. So designs on paper conceivably taken from Chinese carved lacquers are only one form of evidence. Another is the, simula the simulation of the relief, the physical texture or the sculptural surface of lacquer imported into other media, including leather, wood, and stone. 
So these timerid objects, the book binding and a carved sandalwood box, indicate the broader consequences of exposure to Chinese objects. Chinese objects inspired timerid artists to adapt the full effect of a medium, carved lacquer, into another medium, maintaining certain visual subjects such as a dragon, while uh, recontextualizing them amid bands or fields of floral or arabesque designs, as we see in the carved sandalwood box on the right, and then uh, additional views here. Such appropriations were non-medium specific and prompted the innovation of new aesthetic effects that refreshed the visual canon of Islamic art under Timurid dynastic patronage. Moreover, a mode of composition found in one medium, such as the cloud collar points, uh, Yun Jian, found in the neck of a Chinese mid 14th century blue and white jar, could be developed in a timorid drawing occupied by a crane and flowers. Or a dragon coursing through fiery clouds along the side of a red lacquered sutra box painted in gold could be adapted to a timorid design on paper, uh, presumably used for an embroidered textile. The sum total of these examples might convey the complexity of the network of timorid artistic practices, an economy of production that involved the extraction of a repertoire of subjects from Chinese sources, flowers, animals, both real and fantastic, so dragons, phoenixes, qilin, and bi xie, uh, meditation on compositional behaviors and forms, and the mimicry of a medium's physical properties in another medium. But were there any other consequences of this design process, especially for the subject matters of drawing, as well as for the medium itself and its status? So all of the drawings that I've shown you so far are the kinds of disposable traces of a design process, the technical materials the artists made and used in lifting the design from one object, adapting it, reworking it, and then applying it to the creation of another object. So, the answer is yes, of course. Um, I have two Timurid period drawings here from the 1420s to 40s that are adaptations of Chinese originals done in pen and ink. Um, it's not possible to identify the specific sources for these images, but the drawings both depict canonical Buddhist saints or Lohans inspired by Chinese models probably from the Song period at the earliest by figures like Li Gong Lin and that were continued into the UN period, uh, where the Timurid models uh, follow the earlier Chinese examples in technique and iconography, uh, but they're certainly not to be mistaken for the work of a native Chinese artist. And the ways in which we can see this is that while the Chinese artist would have worked with a brush um, creating these expressive strokes of ink on paper, when you study these drawings very closely, it's almost like paint by numbers, a little bit more um, artful than that. But, this, the, but the timid artists are simulating the expressive Chinese brush by first doing an underdrawing in a single unweighted line, and then literally painting in these expressive brush marks, simulating the effects of the expressive brush by um, another uh, means, and uh, presumably also not understanding all of the complex cultural associations of Chinese pen and ink uh, literati uh, painting, this technique of Bei Miao Hua. Another drawing, um, also from the Timurid period, shows two of these Lohans faithful to its Chinese iconographic source, but it's executed in a manner of drawing that's far closer to the habitual manner of drawing found in Timurid art, where we see here two um, Lohans walking, one holding a staff, uh, and accompanied at their middle by a subjugated uh, tiger. I could show you many more such examples that show the ways in which the Chinese iconography of the Lohan is adapted. Uh, its ultimate is expression is the emergence of a single sheet drawing of a tiger, which was a subject unprecedented in, in Persian art. But 
looking at these different models uh, ultimately liberated the Persian artist to a degree that just drawing a tiger was an interesting thing to create as a fully developed um, drawing. So these drawings together offer one example from a handful of instances in which Timurid artists recode an iconographic prototype from outside of the religious culture, substituting one symbolic meaning for another. And what I mean by that is that they've taken an iconography of the canonical Buddhist saint and they've applied it to the representation of the Sufi dervish. These, in an Islamic setting, are representations of dervishes. These sometimes wild, mystical, unorthodox figures. Another example of this recoding, <clears throat> some years after the embassy, is in a copy of a book called The Book of Ascension, uh, written in Uyghur script by a Hari Malik Bakshi in 1436 for Shah Rukh's library that portrays the story of the Prophet Muhammad's nighttime ascension from Mecca to Jerusalem and then of his ascension through the seven heavens on the back of a miraculous beast named Burak. In each of these seven heavens, he meets with the prophets who had come before him since the time of Adam. He meets various angels. Um, he's led on his path by the angel Gabriel. And then eventually he comes into the presence of God, where various aspects of the Muslim faith are negotiated and agreed upon, including the number of daily prayers. It's a sort of an astronomical number in the thousands to begin with. And Muhammad bargains God down to five, uh, which is, you know, good. Uh, and then he travels on to paradise and hell. And all of these places are represented in the cycle of images. Um, but it's interesting that in these different heavens, that the Muslim artists turn to Buddhist models, like the Avalokiteshvara Guanyin, for multiple headed angels, uh, such as the uh, Muslim angel of prayer, as well as to Buddhist inspired seated poses for the angel half fire, half snow that holds a tespe, a rosary also made half fire, half snow. So details like these are accompanied, are sort of provided partly by the accompanying text, but the actual visual models are taken from the religion of Buddhism outside um, of Islam. So uh, in order to visualize the text, um, the Timurid artists look to extra Islamic iconographic prototypes. Almost there. It was the, I'm gonna blame the video guy. Uh, so the peaked exchange orchestrated between Yongle and Shah Rukh, uh, no less than direct access to Chinese art and architecture described by Giatha Din, lent Chinese models a renewed salience for Timurid artists who sought to create new visual subject matters. And this was one important aspect of the Ming Timurid cultural exchange. More broadly, access to, Ch Timur to Chinese art and artistry resulted in the appropriation and refinement of a repertoire of subjects used in different media with diverse expressive formal outcomes. These objects, whether of carved wood or stone, leather bindings or ceramics, retained the aura of elite Chinese commodities, but appeared in formal idioms and styles that were distinctly timorid. You'd never confuse these objects as Chinese objects. In other examples, iconographic types from Buddhism were recoded for use by Islam. Exposure to the range of Chinese art and perhaps access to works in pen and ink of the sort made by literati gentlemen scholars was perhaps the single most important stimulus in establishing drawing as an artistic medium in its own right, a development of the early Timurid period that grew in subsequent years. In effect, these reactions parallel the character of Giatha Din's narrative. The perspectives he offers on Chinese art and architecture experienced firsthand. He was obviously impressed by the ingenuity of Chinese architects and engineers, 
evidenced through fortifications, bridges, pagodas, temples, and city planning. Materials and techniques of construction and decoration, and the skill with which Chinese artists and craftsmen executed their work, are recurring emphases of his narrative. And in several occasions, he's so moved by what he sees as to assert that artists and craftsmen outside of China would have been unable to make the things of equal quality and that the Chinese artists were peerless. He even, in some point, says that people should go to China to learn how to make these things. The scope of his description of Chinese temple and pagoda architecture and art are presently unique, and his narrative is the most developed cross-cultural document in its assessment of the art traditions outside the Temurid world. Though he gently reminds us that Buddhist practices of worshipping idols ran counter to Islam's monotheism, and that making idols could be construed as a challenge to God's creative power as the great fashioner, they didn't diminish his interest in describing what he saw or in stating his respect for those who made them. He is, on the whole, positive and non-judgmental in narrating what he sees. To reference the Chinese Buddhists, he uses the term idol worshipper, focusing on practice, references to unbelief, in contrast to Islam's monotheism and social codes, occur only in discussions about crime and punishment through references to the infidel code, the kishvi kafiri, and Chinese infidels, kafirani khatai. There's only one occasion where he mentions the actualization of Buddhist spaces of worship by huge crowds of infidels bowing down before an idol. And I think the fact that he visited most of these sites when they were not in use is really quite significant. So he didn't actually have to confront the use of these spaces by worshippers, with the exception of one uh, moment. One further aspect of his encounters with Buddhist art and architecture that demands attention concerns his apparent reticence about subject matter in a narrative report that favours making over meaning. Despite the fact that he was steeped in an artistic tradition of the arts of the book, where images were related across several registers to the texts that they accompanied, or portable objects adorned with abstract imagery and epigraphic texts, hence a system of meaningful signs that were operative in Timurid art, he wasn't a dummy. He really understood how meaning could be generated through various means um, in art. Uh, he's not concerned at all with the complexities of Buddhist iconography. Other than identifying major idols like Shakyamuni or giving descriptive labels for the exoteric content of representations, his recurrent focus is on the materiality of art. And at several moments in the narrative, we know that there were people available to him who could have explained these niceties to him. So it's not that there were no opportunities to learn about the iconography. So the seeming illegibility of Buddhist subject matter is hard to explain under these uh, circumstances. But in conclusion, the absence of Buddhist iconographic differentiation in the artist's journal, whether caused by discomfort, ignorance, or disinterest, could be thought of in more positive terms as preparing the ground for a free, creative play and cultural projection. Rather than ponder what it all meant, consider instead how it might become useful. The effects of exposure to Chinese art are clearly apparent in the artworks made by timid artists from the time of Gyathadin and beyond. Thank you very much.